is totally amazing and totally terrific. Totally terrific, totally terrific. God is truly amazing. You may be seated. And family, we're in the, the finale of the new series called Please Answer the Phone. But before I get started, before I get started, if you are here with your children, if you're here with your children, I want you to take them by the hand. I want you to take them by the hand. I want you to take them by the hand. And I want you to stand up. Parents, stand up. We, we're going to pray. Because kids are going back to school. And you're going back to work. And um, God is going to take care of these kids when they're away from you. God is going to take care of these kids when they're away from you. So just for a brief moment, let's enter into a moment of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for precious life that you give. Regardless of what culture say or the world say today, life belongs to you. Not in the hands of government, not in the hands of a president. Life belongs to you. And Father, right now, the life that you've given these parents through their children, Father, I thank you for the life that you've given them. Father, I thank you for these young minds, young hearts, and young souls. And as they go to school, coming back this Tuesday in this county and all over the world, as they enter into a new school year, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you cover and keep them as they are away from their parents. Father, parents do so much, they trust so much, and they send their kids off to a place where you're not there to protect them as parents, but Father, you are. And Father, in the name of Jesus, cover the young minds and the hearts and the souls and the spirits of these, your great people. And Father, I pray for these children that they're ready, they're ready to be educated, they're disciplined, and they're ready to follow guidelines and instructions. And Father, discipline and love will be in their heart. And when they're in school, Father, I pray that you open their mind to receive what is being taught. They're highly intelligent children. They're highly intelligent teenagers. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you cover them. Keep them from things they don't know and make them aware of things that come near them. Father, I pray that there will be no violence in any schools, there will be no, 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 no hurting of any children or teachers or administration, that there will be no violence whatsoever. I pray against the snares of the enemy that tried to sift out our children, just like they tried to sift out Jesus even when he was born. Father, they wanted to get rid of him, but not our children. You put your heads of protection around them online and in the building that you cover them from, from preschool to college and college graduates. Cover every school in the name of Jesus. They need you right now, Father. So take over their mind, will, emotions, imaginations, and affections and have them ready to learn. Father, let them have engaging conversations and let them grow each and every day. Father, I pray for the mothers and fathers that are sending their kids away from them into a school in which they're trusted. Father, I pray that you remove the stress and the doubt and the fear and anxiety that they can have by sending their kids off to school. Father, place in them a calm peace to know that their children are taken care of. But we know that your love and your spirit guard our children every day of their life. The hedge of protection that will keep them will bring them home each day. And as they learn in their growing, Father, grow us as parents so we can understand them better and love them more dearly but we'll always place them at your feet to worship you and to be led by you and to be guided by you. And Father, show them the love. And Father, keep them safe each and every day. So I thank you, Father, for these children and these parents today. Bless them in every way. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for our kids. They're dismissed at this time to my uh, left and to your right. We have a lady there with the sign that said Children's Church. And you can go with them, kids, and enjoy yourself. Thank God for our children. And as I said before, we are in the finale of a series that is called Please Answer the Phone. Please Answer the Phone. And I'm so elated and so happy about what we've uh, been listening to that God has been speaking to us in this new series. God has really, really ramped us up and showed us who he is in terms of how we should respond. Please answer the phone. And one thing about phones is that you can rest assured. One thing you can do, if you can't do anything else, you can cut the conversation off. When you don't want to listen no more, you don't have to argue. There's no doors to close. There's nothing. You can just hit decline when they're coming in and end when they're going out. That's what we can do. We have that capability and control. 
But on the other side of that, we need to make sure that we're right, just as we want persons on the other end to be right. All right, because we got to make sure we're right. Because, see, we can hang up and be wrong. You know that, right? We can hang up and be wrong. Because we can get angry with people when we don't understand or we misunderstand what they're saying. But we can also be misunderstood because God can show us who we are even in a moment. So if you can turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Genesis 32, verses 22 through 28. That's Genesis 32, verses 22 through 28. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, we have them on the screens on both sides of me, on my right and my left. And your right and your left, we have the scriptures there. Genesis 32, verses 22 through 28. Genesis 32, verses 22 through 28. I'll read reading from the NLT. That's the New Living Translation. And it reads, it reads, it reads. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two served wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until dawn began to break. When the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip, wrenched it out of, out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, You'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for our time together. Father, bless your word and that it continue to go out. And as it's going out, it is cutting up and restoring the minds and the hearts of these, your people, and that you may be glorified. Thank you for today and every day that you give us to be a beacon of light of hope for those around us, let us carry your gospel, not just in the building, but away from here, back out into the world where it's needed most. We thank you, Father. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 And like I said, family, we're in the finale. This is the last one called Please Answer the Phone. And today I want to tag a title to the text. Simply put, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. I'm not tired. So, family... I want to ease into this introduction today with an indication that I have some good news and I got some bad news. Let's start with the bad news first, okay? The, the bad news is that we got an adversary that unleashes spiritual weapons of mass destruction on the body of Christ that is inhibiting our ability to advance as God has intended for us. There's an enemy. Now, whether you believe it or not, it's totally up to you. But you're going to deal with some forces that is not always people. It's a force that uses people, and we think it's people. It's what's in them. It's symptoms of tri triggers that the enemies can place on the inside of any of us, as my mama would say, to act a fool. It's the enemy. It's the enemy. Now, please, we don't want to get so, so detached hermeneutically that we think everything is a demon. Okay, so we, we, we want to have some perspective. Yes, there's forces on the outside called spiritual forces that the enemy could use and use people to carry it out. But if your tire fall off because you have four missing lug nuts because you're driving, a demon didn't get you. It's, it's that the people at the place didn't put all the other four lug nuts on, okay? We're not going to classify everything a demon because we have to have the right perspective for what it is. And we don't want to get into and fall into a religious context where we make everything a demon. And we want, we need to be, things to be cast out of us seven days a week, 24 hours a day, when it's really, we don't have no discipline. You can't call a demon a demon when it's you being undisciplined. Go to bed. That's why you're tired. It's not a demon. You want to watch TV all night. And you say this job ain't for me. It ain't the job. Go to bed at 8.30. You won't sleep at 7.30 in the morning when it's time to go to work. It's not a demon. You need sleep. So we have to have the right perspective for what we call a demon. 
And it's the adversary that unleashes spiritual weapons of mass destructions on the body of Christ. And God wants to advance our future so we can grow and be better. And it's the weird work of the weapon that, that the enemy uses, the weapon we don't even know that the weapon is being worked on against us. And at times we, 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 we make excuses and there's weapons and we're not praying. We're not praying and we want things to change. And, and, and the thing is that maybe God will move when you go to him and start praying to him about what the issue is. But this is the deal. Please don't forget, he moves in his time, not ours. And when we understand that clearly, we need God's word so we can be reassured in what his promises is. But here's the good news. Isaiah 54, 16 and 17 says this. Watch this. I have created a blacksmith who fans the coal beneath the forge and makes the weapons of destructions. And I've created the armies that destroy. But in the coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. The be these benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Now, are you a servant first? See, we, 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 we find stuff on TikTok that we quote, but we ain't a servant. We don't know him. We hadn't encountered him. But we said we live, live for a God that we don't know. And we know our boyfriend or girlfriend better than we know God. And she or he can't save you. And this is what we got to understand. Having the right perspective but knowing God's word is not just Sunday. Knowing God's word is every week. It, it, it's called becoming a disciple, which means we become a disciple by knowing his word, not by being a fan of who he is. Because what happens is we become fans and we don't become those that study who he is. I remember when I got married, what I did is I said, God, I'm going to study my wife. Because this is the reason why I have to study my wife. It just, just, just does not make her life better. It makes mine better. Because if I know her, I know how she's going to move. And we move in a rhythm that's good for both of us, not just for her. So when you get to know God, you move in a rhythm that, that satisfies you and him. Because it's your purpose that you serve him and the benefit comes from him to you. So we got to understand that when, when, when he says that vindication will come from me, we don't have to get back at nobody. He said, I, the Lord, have spoken. The vindication of the servant come from the Lord. See, because everybody won't clap back. Everybody won't clap back, but this is the deal. What about you clapping back? And then you getting punished for clapping back when you didn't have to, when you could have just stepped behind God and let God clap back for you. Isn't it better than being punished for something you didn't have to do when you got a person that'll take care of it for you? This is the deal. Have you ever been like, and I don't promote violence, but have you ever been in a fight and you're like, wow, somebody came and rescued me. It probably was your brother. It probably was your sister, but you didn't mind they coming in and stepping in and handling some things when you were falling back, when you were falling down. I'll never forget, I was in the seventh grade, and, um, and, and I know it's going to sound weird, but check this out. In the seventh grade, a friend of mine said, okay, this dude named Adam want to fight you. I was like, okay, we can square up. We just go outside. Seventh grade, I'm like, look, I'm gonna I ain't going to take many hits. I'm going to jab. He said, Reggie, this is what you got to do. You got to jab and move. I'm like, why? Dude, short. He ain't taller than me. I got him. He said, Reggie, he's strong, and he wrestled really good. I said, okay, I got to stay. So I was like boxing. I was all back out. Everything in my head was don't fall. Don't fall. I was jabbing. We were going in. We were going out. I was like, don't let him grab my legs. I was like, every time he been down, I've been down. I was like, you ain't get my legs because if you fall on top of me, they done already told me you're a good wrestler. But then one of my boys came. One of my boys came. So when he was trying to get the best of me to get me down, my boy came and just snatched him, rolled him off. I was like, yeah, yeah. So I need that rescue because if my boy hadn't showed up, Adam might have won the fight. And I couldn't let that go down in seventh grade because I had to come to school the next day. And I didn't want to hear that. I, mm -mm. I didn't want to be wrestled down and all folded up and looking like a blanket the next day when people say, oh, bro, he folded you up like a blanket. You look like my mom fitting sheet you look you look just like I didn't want to hear those words so I had to, I had to I had to really focus on what I'm doing so God is saying can you focus on me because I, I, I am the one that'll come in and I'll sweep it and I'll pull it away but do you know me see I had to know my friend that came in and helped 
Now, I know you like it. I don't condone violence, but I'm just saying it's just an analogy, okay? I'm not saying go out there and start fighting people and wait for the Lord to show up. You might end up on TikTok not looking good, okay? No, 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 don't condone violence. But there's a way that you can handle it that it will not even get there. God said, I, I will vindicate you. I will vindicate you. Now, listen, listen to this. He says, every tongue, every which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. In other words, God is saying, you can shut some people up. And let me tell you sometime the way, the best way to shut people up is to not say anything and walk off. That's the best way to get mouths closed sometimes. Because this is the deal. If you keep people guessing about what you think, they got more to worry about than you do. So you got to be able to say, okay, you know what? I can walk away from this because this, th- this is the thing. The enemy can use our anger against us to the point that we're so angry. What happens is, is that we turn around and do things that get us more trouble than the person that's actually coming at us. And, and you have to say, God is going to take care of you. I'm not going to worry because I'm not even going to argue with you. Because you know what? The victory is already mine. And this is interesting. Now, how, because the enemy is working a weapon. But through Isaiah, God proclaimed the weapon won't work. Now, now notice this. Isaiah does not specifically identify what the weapon is. The assumption can be made that it does not matter. It does not matter, if, just for real. If you read your word, you know the weapon does not matter because it will not prosper. Now, this is the deal. You can't help the weapon to prosper because some of us do. Our behavior is an indication of what we want in our life. And if you're helping the weapon to prosper, there's the problem. Because sometimes it's not the weapon. Sometimes it's us helping the weapon to prosper. You know you shouldn't date him. You know you shouldn't date her. You know you shouldn't be there. And now the weapon is forming because of your presence in a place you shouldn't be. You don't believe me? Ask David. David was somewhere he should not have been. He was at home when he saw Bathsheba when he should have been at war. Wrong place. And wrong place have gotten so many people killed because they should have been where they were supposed to be. Where are you supposed to be? Think about that. Where are you supposed to be? And are you in the wrong places that's more about your entertainment than it is about your well-being? And we got to remember that, that God will put us in places, but there are some places God tells us not to go. He kept Paul from Asia Minor. He's like, uh, not yet, not yet, not yet. And there are places we'll willfully go not thinking about what we need to do. Watch God. Watch God. He, he, the weapon, it doesn't matter if the weapon forms against you. Isaiah does not limit the ver- veracity and the accuracy of this statement to a certain period of time, and it does not mean that anything will happen. But whatever happened, God can handle. It does not matter whenever or whatever. It does not matter because it will not work. And I believe we got some witnesses online in this building that can honestly say there have been time in our lives where, where you see the wrong happen and it's the wrong time. Right? We can honestly say that we can admit through the experience and circumstance that we, we did not expect God to allow this to happen then. Right? There's some times in our life where we, hey, we, we, I, did not think, I did not think we'll ever be here doing this again. We, we didn't think, we didn't fathom. There's some things in our life that show up unexpectedly. Raise your hand if some stuff that showed up in your life unexpectedly. Let's, let's be real. Then showed up unexpectedly and you're like, wow, this, this, this wasn't for me. And this wasn't my plan. And trust me, it wasn't my plan to be here preaching. Long ago, I was fine at home, and God changed that. Not me. Not me. Not me. Now, now I'm, I submit to his authority and will, but it wasn't in my plans. And God will change some things, and, but what he did was he changed it, and it bettered me and bettered my family. I didn't see better coming because I was fine in comfort. And this is what God did. And this is the worst time for things to happen for some people. But situations give a revelation of what God proclaims in Isaiah. And that is it doesn't matter. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. But don't help the weapon to form and don't help it to prosper. But it will not prosper according to God's word. Now watch this. In order to overcome the weapon, we got to identify some things. And in our time together today, I want to identify and expose what I believe is the enemy using his way with us And it's prohibiting us from advancing what God wants for our future. And I want to expose the weapon. And I'm going to tell you what the weapon is. Here it is. It's called settling. We settle for some things we shouldn't settle for. 
with a God that's bigger than what we're settling for. What are you settling for in your life? Now, please don't leave here today and change up everything that God didn't tell you to change because you said, Pastor said, I shouldn't settle for anything. Some of us say, oh, I'm not going to settle for this. You wrong. It's not about your settling. It's about the correction. Because what happens is, is that we will say, okay, well, I'm not going to settle for that anymore when we need to be corrected on what we're doing. And some of us don't like correcting or being corrected because correction can bring pain and it can pull us away from what it is that we really like and want to do. Correction is good, family. Correction is great. Correction is for our benefit. Correction is because he loves us. And one thing about it is I have daughters and I have to correct them. And does it hurt me? Yes. But the deal is when I leave here and I go to see the Lord, I need to make sure I've done my best. My best. Because he's going to hold me accountable. And it's not about what they like or don't like. It's more about being corrected in the moment so they'll be good when I'm gone. And my daughters always say, Dad, don't talk that way. I said, the Bible says there's time for everything. There's a time to live and there's a time to die. I got to make sure you straight before we leave here. Because it's my obligation to you to make sure you straight. Now, I can't make you do anything, but God will bring you back. He'll bring you back. He'll correct you out there that'll push you back home. I'm a believer, and it happened to me. It, it, it. Look, the prodigal son is just not a story. It's real life. It's real life. And God will correct you in areas of your life that will bring you back to where you need to be and bring you in line and in focus. And it's an amazing example right here in Genesis. Jacob's story is a powerful personification of the importance of persistent prayer. What is your prayer life like? Because the deal is, some of the things we go through is because of the blind spots in our life and we don't give it to God in prayer. Can you pray to God? I know you get tired of when you lay in that bed. Look, I'm a pastor. I know too. I feel the same thing you feel when I'm laying in that bed. And you know when you get in your warm spot and you're like, oh Lord, I didn't pray. And that warm spot feels so good. And you just roll on out anyway and just get on your knees and give it to God. And I'm not saying this, that's religious rhetoric or anything. What I am saying is, is that God wants to hear from you. Now, God didn't say that you got to pray in your bed or on the side of your bed every night. You can speak to him anywhere. I pray for, with him. I pray to him in the car. I pray for, with him on, in the shower. I pray to him when I'm walking. I pray all, consistently. Prayer without ceasing for me means I can pray anywhere. I can pray in the midst of an argument and be like, God, if you can just close their mouth and give me enough time to get out of here, I'm straight. If you can just close the mouths of these, if you can just close it. I remember one time I was at work and there was a guy was talking to me and he was just really, he was just going off at me. And I'm like, okay. I was like, you know what, God, if you can just close this mouth so I can go in my office and close the door and I can pray. Because one or two things going to happen. I'm going to end up saying something that I shouldn't say, or I can pray and give it to you and go in and just take a moment, get myself together, give all of that to you and come back out. Matter of fact, I went in, prayed. He knocked on my door and took me to lunch after snapping off on me about his mistake. Took me to lunch. That was all God. It was not me. Because let me tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that. I wanted to get physical. But see, I always call my wife. I was going to call my wife. Baby, I'm going to need a new job, so just hold on. We got enough money. We good. All right, bye. Then I was going to go in. But I had to call her first because it, 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 my life won't just change. Hers will change too. So I got, I just, I got to have enough wherewithal to understand that it's not just me. But God changes scenarios, but we don't have to act out. It's been times you wanted to grab your kids. I know it. But you say, oh, Lord, get me before I get them. Get me. Get, get me because the pain that I might inflict may lock me up. I don't want to do that. God, take me, please. Please take me because they're getting on my last nerve. And everybody got a last nerve. Everybody. 
It's the one before the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's that one. It, it's the last one. And we got to understand that God will vindicate us, but we got to understand we got to spend time in prayer. There's three principles I want to give you before we get out of here today. The first principle is this. Our consistent prayer is necessary. The persistence of seeking God's blessing. Number one, the persistence of seeking God's blessing. Watch verse 24. It says, J- Jacob was left alone. Now watch this. Sometimes... The modern day Jacobs need to be left alone. Jacob is not trying to be insensitive, but way down in the recesses of his heart and soul, he's crying out. And he is saying, please leave me alone. How many of you all come home with your children and y'all want to be left alone? Just for a minute. Just for a minute. How many of you come home, period, if you have no children, if you got anybody with blood running through their veins in your house, you just want to be left alone. You just want to be left. Men, follow me. If you marry, when you walk in, you just want to be left alone. Give me five or ten minutes just in a space by myself. I just got through talking to all those people at work. Now you're like, well, Pastor, what if I work from home? I didn't have my door closed all day. I still need five minutes. I've been on the phone all day. I just need a few moments. And this is the deal. Fellas, it's not just us. They need time alone, too. With my wife, I start entering that threshold near her office, and she give me that look. I'm like, yeah, she needs some, she need a minute. She need a minute. Let me just get on back. I don't need, need to bother her. I, today is not, you know, she just need a moment by herself. She need a moment. And how many get excited when people leave your house and you're the only one at home? Raise your hand. Come on, come on. Let's get excited. Now, fellas, if you're married, don't raise it too far right now. Don't raise it too high. But we, we need, and we need time alone. Time alone isn't bad. Moses went to spend time with God by himself. Jesus went to be with God alone. We need time alone. We need time alone. Jacob was yelling, leave me alone. Jacob cried out, leave me alone, reveals his inclination towards a self-reliance and independence. Right? But this is the deal. It's okay to have self-reliance and independence, but you can't let it have you. Because there will be struggles in our lives, and when we have struggles in our life, what will happen is, is that we'll end up depending so much on us that we forget that we got a God that can take care of everything. Now watch this. Watch this. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. We face temptation and rely solely on our own understanding, strength, and plan. Now watch this. He says this, right? He says these words. He said, lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge ye that I will direct thy path. Right? So he he says, listen, it's okay to have understanding, but you need me. Where does understanding come from? God. And we live in a world that says, oh, you did it yourself. You did it yourself. And we live in a world that says, I don't need God anymore because all of my understanding and strength come from me. No, 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 no. That could be not more further from the truth. This, this can be an isolated and spiritual struggle for many of us. How many of us struggle with self-reliance? Just be real. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, you know it's true. Wow, you guys are great. I struggle with self-reliance because I, I'm, I'm a doer. I move. I'm motivated. I need to go. I need to do it. Oh, I'll handle it. I'll handle it. I'll handle it. I'll handle it. And one of the things when I first started leading in corporate America, even, even in church, is the self-reliance to do it myself. And some of us are raising kids instead of teaching them, we like, get out the way. No, no, no. They need to get some things wrong so they can see how to do it right. They, they need it. Because if we do everything else for them, when they get older, guess what's going to happen? They're going to feel entitled. And guess what you're going to say? Where they get that from? You did everything for them. Now when they got a coach trying to coach them up, they get mad. They get mad. And they believe everything they should have because no one told them or taught them that they needed to be corrected and shown the right way. So when they get a coach, they kicked off the team. When they get a job, they kicked out of the building. When they got a teacher, they've been put out of school. Because correction started at home. It starts at home. It starts at home. It starts at home. And this is the deal. My, my daughters, I know they didn't like me earlier on. I know they didn't. 
I know they didn't. In high school, in middle school, they did not like me. I, I was like a, a, a Bible in a nightmare at the same time. They didn't like me. But this is the deal. They are beginning to understand at 21, 22, they're beginning to understand what life is. Because now they come in my office and sit down and talk to me about their life. They're like, you don't need to know my life. I'm good. Yes, I'm in seventh grade. You don't understand me. I know everything. No. No, I know everything. Yeah, I know everything. I know everything. And if you ask them to get out and find out how much gas needs to go in the car, they could not tell you. But they understand in life better because everything wasn't done for them. Because this is the deal. I don't want to do everything for them. And as I get older, I want to do less for them. Because they need to understand that they come into a place of their own in God where they're growing up. And now I can just guide them and talk to them. Guide and talk, guide and talk, guide and talk, guide with words, guide with actions and show them what life look like so they can get down. Because this is the deal. I dream of going to their house, opening their refrigerator and eating their food, closing it back, drinking their water and going home. And don't pay for nothing. That's what I dream one day. That's a dream. Martin Luther King had a dream. I do too. I want to eat my children potato chips and not replace them. That's what I want to do because they ate mine and they were gone before I got home and I had to figure out something else. I want to do that. Not because I don't like them, but because I love them enough to know what it feels like and they'll get a perspective of what that is. Now watch this. Here we go. Here we go. He wanted to be left alone. Self-reliance. Now this is the deal. We can want to be left alone to the point that we're trusting our own understanding and strength and not God. The Bible reminds us to trust the Lord wholeheartedly, submitting all aspects of our lives to his guidance. And when we surrender to God, we acknowledge his sovereignty. And he'll direct our path and lead us on the right course. And some of us have been trained not to express pain. And sometimes we need a minute to process because if we do not process properly our emotions, we may say something in the moment that becomes a word that will function as a nail. And this is the deal. A nail, you can nail it in, but when you remove it, there's still a hole. You can pierce somebody's heart with your words. And the hole will be left there, and they will hurt every time they see you because they remember what you did. So we have to choose our words carefully, and, our, and, and I'm telling you, we have to go in prayer. And I know we get upset. I know, but even when, I, when we're upset and angry, we got to sit up, submit ourselves to the authority of God. So when we submit ourselves, God, take the words from me because you know what I want to say. I, I want to say something to my wife. I want to say some things to my children. God, I want to say some things to my employer. God, take the words. Because remember what I said earlier, people will get on your what? Last nerve, Right? They will. They will. And, it does, and this is the deal. It does not matter. It can be at the gas station, at work, at home, wherever you go, people can get on your last nerve. I, I'm, I'm going to write a sermon about that, and it's going to be titled Last Nerve. Watch this. Because once the nail go in, the indention is still there. So sometimes it is important to give people time. Some people snap off because they need time, not because they're angry about the situation. Can you give them time? Because the conversation can become better and have more accurate data when you give them some time. And this is the thing about anger. When you don't submit anger to God, anger will lead you to bad decisions. And when it leads you to bad decisions, you'll do some things that you regret. Submit the anger to God. And the best thing, the way to do some time is to just step away and give people time. Give people time. And when you give them time, they begin to understand you begin to understand. How many of us said some things and did some things we were like, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have, wait, raise your hands. It's, I, I shouldn't have said that, man, because it cuts so hard. You, you know those times when you get in the car and you're like, man, I should have said it differently. Or, or you walk away from one room to the other and said, I should have said it differently. That time alone is necessary. Alone is some time. But not to the point that we don't need God no more. Because when you try to do it by yourself, it can be hard. In verse 22, Jacob has took his two wives. 
his servant, and 11 children. Now, now let me explain this because I want us to have the right hermeneutic about this, okay? Let me explain it. I know that it says two wives. And some of us are like, wow, I like that. I like that. Two wives. Now, you can like that if you want to. Because everything that is prescriptive is not descriptive. Okay? I've said that a lot. Just because the Bible said it doesn't mean you're supposed to do it in terms of that. Watch this. Watch this. Just because it's descriptive doesn't mean that it happens that way for us. It was a cultural thing for them in those days. So when people read the Bible with the wrong hermeneutic, we can come to an inaccurate conclusion. Now, it does not mean that God endorsed having 15 wives. Online, you with me? It does not mean that. Try it if you want to. I'm not sure how you're going to end up. End up in marriage counseling by yourself, crying. Now, now this is the deal. It's, it's descriptive, but it's not prescriptive for us, and it's not what God is saying he supports. Verse 24, watch this, because there's some things, no matter how much you love them, you must wrestle with alone. Wounds that you don't know about. And most of the time, it takes us a while to know that we are affected. Here it is. God had to get Jacob alone to deal with him. God will get you in some places by yourself to deal with you. To make you better. And this is the deal. When you won't listen, he'll allow circumstances to happen to get your attention. He will. And some of our heartaches can be eliminated if we pray more. And give them to God and stop trying to wrestle with. Because I've said it plenty of times from right here. God is not interested in having supervisors on his team. You're the body of Christ. You're not the supervisor for Christ. The body. If he need assistance, he'll let you know in prayer. Because he's constantly telling us what to do. And we're living in a culture that says, hey, I want you to give me, but I don't want you to tell me what to do. Now watch this. Jacob is understanding here about his struggle. And watch what Psalms 46 and 10 say. He says, be still and know that I'm God. I will exalt among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. He will be exalted. You exalt him, things change. Things change. And you exalt him not in just your praise and worship, but even in your prayer. And every day is praise and worship for us as believers. Because it's the Christ that we serve and we love love, and we meet, and he means so much to us. Now, number two, the struggle of surrender. The struggle of surrender. The str- persistent prayer, but we also struggle. Now, watch this. Watch, watch Jacob now. Watch Jacob here. It says in verse 25, when the man saw they would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Watch verse 26. Then the man said, let me go for the day the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob did not start out wanting anything from God. God wanted something from him. God wanted all of Jacob's self-reliance and fleshly scheming. God wants your self-reliance in believing and thinking that you can do it all by yourself. Because you'll come to a point where you're going to holler out for him. You can live your whole life believing that everything you did is all you. And one day, it'll stop. Because you'll put yourself or be in or God will allow a situation to occur where you have to call on him. Live long enough, you'll see it. TikTok, live long enough, you'll see it. Instagram. You live long enough, you'll see it. Facebook, you live long enough, you'll see it. Things will creep up on your doorstep, and God will have to save you from it. Now, this is the deal. Don't use God, because he's smart enough to know when he's being used for only a handout. Because he will allow things to happen that you built up and brought onto yourself. And let you sit there to learn it as a lesson. My mother always told me, she said, you go to jail, son, you'll sit there and I'll see you possibly online now because they got online stuff. They ain't coming to get you. Sit there and think about what you did. She said, because there's nothing you can tell me that you 
have not done that caused you to get there. You better run the other way. And every, all the time I was growing up, I ran the other way. Because I didn't have a Savior on earth, but I knew I had one in God. But I knew because I knew the principles of who God was, I didn't need to be in certain places. Now watch this. Here we go. Here we go. Self-reliance. And God came to take it away. And this is the deal. He'll take it away by force if necessary. God is asking, are you willing to step into what I got for you? Because Jacob, he's not bad, but Israel is better. And some of us are realizing now that there's some things about you that used to be okay, but it's no longer okay and you don't like it no more. Be honest. There's some things about yourself that you, it was cool then, but it's not now. You matured and you ain't going to do that no more. I don't care what other people are doing. I don't care if you got a 53-year-old friend that go to the club and he the old dude at the club now. You don't want to hang with him no more. I don't care if you got the girlfriend that all she wants to do is party, get drunk, clap back, get smashed, get toe up, smoke weed, fall out, and that's her weekend regimen. You ain't there no more. It was good back then, but you're like, no, I like not being dizzy. I don't want to smell like that every weekend. I don't want to urinate in the parking lot because I'm drunk. I don't, that, that, that was fine back then, but no, I've changed. Uh-uh. I, I, well, you think you better know I'm saving money and I feel better. And life has changed for me. And it's amazing how life changed for you, but when it doesn't advance for other people, it's a problem for them. Don't let it be a problem for you. It's a problem for them. You're, if, you, if you're getting better in life, you're getting better. And everybody ain't going to ride with your better. And if they can't ride with your better, see them every now and then. Or we got phones now. Hit decline. That, that's it. And, and Jacob is, is, is no longer saying, hey, I, I got to be better. I got to be better. And Jacob is being, is being helped to be realized by God that he has to get better. God no longer wants him in that place. God has opened your eyes and there's something about you that you didn't see before. And you see it now. And you see it and you're like, God, now? And, but it's better. It's better. He's saying, you, 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 you're a Jacob. You're a Jacob and you're getting to know it better from me. Because the self-reliance had to go away. I had to put you alone, deal with you, get you to understand, get you to grow so you can become better because your name going to change. Your name going to change. He says, you're out of Jabbok. You're out of Jabbok. See, Jacob was crossing over, and Jabbok is a different place. And he had to understand and grow because he had a different place in his life. And now that he's in a different place, he realized some things that he didn't know before. And he's saying to all of you, you're in Jabbok. I'm pulling you out of that season into another season that you're going to grow and be better. But can you surrender? Can, I know you're struggling with me. I know you're trying to get your way and want your way, but I'm pulling you into a new season that you're going to either go in kicking or screaming trying to get out, but you're going. You're in a season now that's different than it used to be before. And we can shout hallelujah to God because we're not there anymore. We're maturing and we're growing because he's getting us to see where we once used to be. And how many of you know that it's better to know where you once was than to still be there? Because that's what he does. He show us who we are. Eyes have seen and ears have not heard the places where God is trying to get you. He says this version of you is good, but I want your future to be better. But it requires Israel, Jacob. Verse 26 says, Jacob wrestled all night in the meaning. He wrestled in the dark. He wrestled and did not know why. Just fighting for his life. And many of us fight for our life because we won't surrender to God. And we're doing it all night. And you said, I'm not tired yet. All of these years, I'm not tired yet. All of these no's, I'm not tired yet. All of the disappointment, I'm not tired yet. All of the no's and the nots and the maybes, I'm not tired yet. Jacob said, I will not get tired. I will not let you go. Watch this. What you got to get out of struggle is what you need to know 
going forward. You got to get some things out of the struggle that will carry you forward. I know I'm not going to do that anymore. I know I'm not going to do that anymore. I know I'm not going to go here anymore. I know I'm not going to face this anymore because God is trying to pull me out of struggle. And there's some things you, you got to understand that you say, hey, God, I'm not relying on self. I'm relying on you, but I'm going to pull on you more, which means it's going to require some discipline for you to grow, right? And you got to sit there. Jacob said, no way in the world that I'm going to let you go. Now, what in your life are you facing and you're talking to God and you're saying, God, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to give on, up on you. You're going to have to bless me. And so many of us, we need to have a relationship with God that we can have that sort of conversation. We had a conversation where, God, you're going to bless me because I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go because I've tried everything else and it did not work. I've been here and I've been there and it did not work. So watch this. That man says, the man says, what's your name? Now Jacob is wrestling with him. He says, what's your name? And he says, I won't let you go. He said, what's your name? He said, I won't let you go. He said, what's your name? He said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. He said, what's your name? Jacob asked for a blessing and he asked God for Jacob's name. The man said, listen, I want to know your name, son. He said, I'm not letting you go unless you bless me. I'm not letting you go because change is about to happen, right? Change is about to happen. What, what's your name? Jacob is asking for a blessing. God is asking for his name. He says, watch this. I'm not going to give up on the blessing. You're going to bless me. Here it is. Most of the time when we say bless me, what we really mean is give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. But God says it here. He said, I'm not going to give you a blessing. I'm actually going to bless you. Which means he's saying, your name shall no longer be swindler, trickster, con artist, schemer. It shall be Israel, which is the prince with God. So he's saying, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to make you a better version of you than you used to be. You're gonna, not going to be the old person. You're going to be the new person because the new person will go get what he's supposed to go get when he needs to go get it because I've Giving you what you need for you to chase it, for you to go after it, because it belongs to you. But what you must understand is you got to, you got to surrender yourself to me so you can get there. Because there's an identity change that needs to happen. There's an identity change that needs to happen. And watch this. Hebrews 12 and 1 says this. Therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so entangles us. Watch this. What sin are we living with that's keeping us from God? We got to address it. We got to address the sin. I know everybody like happy messages, and you can get online, and you can go to 52 to 950,000 churches out there that will give you sugar-coated messages every day that will tell you that you get in the house, it's on the way, you get in the car, your kid's not going crazy no more, don't worry, your wife loved you more than she ever loved you before, your husband loved you more than you ever loved you before, you're going to get the promotion, you're going to get, 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 get. They'll give you the candy-coated message, but they don't tell you that God says, I want your obedience. Wow, he put it in his word, obedience is greater than sacrifice. They're not going to preach obedience to sin. What is hindering you from living God's best for your life? Sin. Could it be the self-sabotaging behavior? Could it be the porn addiction, the alcohol, the, 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 the weed? What, what could it be that's keeping you from being your best? What could it be? Could it be the people you are around? Could it be the people you live with? Could it be there's a some symptoms going on inside of you that comes from your past that has not been dealt with? Could it be that therapy is a good thing from you not talking to your girlfriend? Because girlfriends, most of the time, they're not therapists. They want what's best for you even if it's not best for you. Same thing for men. And with us, we'll just say, bro, forget about it. Let's go. Because this is the deal. With most men, we don't want to talk about what you're going through either. We, 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 we'll listen, but, 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 but we're saying, listen, forget that. Let's go do something. Get your mind off of it. How many of you know getting your mind off sin doesn't mean that you're going to stop sinning? 
What is it that keeping you away that puts you in a struggle that God is trying to get you to a different place of transformation in your life and you consistently wrestling and involving in a plan that God said, I need you to surrender, but you won't surrender and embrace the purposes of God in our life. It's not always easy, but when you let go of your own desires and yield to God calling, we find true meaning and fulfillment in the journey called faith. Most of us say, hey, faith, faith, faith. And I'm sick of people talking about manifesting stuff. You cannot manifest things if you don't have God. God is the object of faith. Nothing is manifest without his work you can't work of anything of your own fruition and even when you created he blessed it and we when he blessed it you still got to go to him for it to survive and be sustained that's what we have to understand i'm sick of manifestation because people are not teaching what manifestation really is and the object of your faith and nothing can be manifested without god you didn't manifest without god you didn't show up in your mother's womb long ago was him planting the seed to make sure that you became who he had already created you to be. And when we understand that and have the right hermeneutic and have the right perspective of who God is, now we're saying, you know what? I'm not a Christian that's going to walk around and parade my hands for abortion because I know where life come from. Oh, it's a touchy subject in the culture. The Bible says different. The Bible said I created both male and female. So no, no, no. It, it can be one of those things. No, you have to pull up on what side you're going to be on. Oh, no, there's a gray area. Ain't no gray areas in the Bible. He talked about it or he didn't. He said what it was, and he means it's in his authority because he's the creator. Period. That's what it is. So watch this. Watch this. Number three, and we're out of here. Number three, and we're out of here. The transformation of identity. Watch what it says in verse 27. What is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Remember, Jacob represented the worst of himself. Israel represented the best version of himself. He had a name change because God had to show him who he was. And many people walk around with the same name and the same condition, and God is trying to call you something else. And everybody else calling you your old name because they believe that you're the same person you used to be. Don't call me pastor, call me servant. Because people have defiled the name of pastor. The greatest name, he said, the greatest is the one who serves. And we, 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 we don't want to, to identify with transformation in a new identity in Christ because it feels as if we're locked in and we can't do everything everybody else does. Please remember, God keeps you from things for your betterment, not because you can't have fun. Because the older you get, you're going to enjoy having fun by yourself at home. Not saying you can't have friends, but fun looks different. It's the best fun you can ever have. It's the fun that don't cost you a whole lot. Because most of the time we go out with people and it costs us more than what it is that we actually should be doing anyway. Watch this. Watch this. And I'm not saying don't go out with friends. Just make sure you select the right friends to be with. Watch this. Watch this. Now, see, there's a metaphor in life that's taking place. God changed his name to Jacob from Jacob to Israel. Why? Because every time the name Jacob was called, he answered to a deceiver. Go clean the room, trickster. Take out the trash manipulator. L listen to the oxymoronic nature of that statement, right? I love you, deceiver. So it's almost like God is saying, in order for you to be who you're supposed to be, I need to change what you answer to. Please, 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 please ask yourself, what am I answering to and why? Why am I answering to the name that people have selected for me that God may not have even chosen? And I'm getting sick of people using words to call people names that their mother didn't give them. Now, I'm not saying if you're from the country and you got a different name that they call you, that's good. Could be your shortening of your middle name or a different name. That may be fine. But there's some derogatory stuff that's being used in culture, and it is not what your mother chose for you or your father or your sister or your brother. Because this is the deal. The same thing that y'all call each other, you wouldn't call your mother that. And you know what I'm talking about. Don't answer the stuff that God said is not you. It's not you. I don't care what culture try to normalize. 
it's not you. There's a level of respect for you as a being created by God that you got to carry with you, regardless of what other people think. Watch this. Watch this. Watch what 2 Timothy 1 and 9 says this. He says, he saved us and called us to be, to be a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. There's a purpose in God for you and a grace that he gives you, but he has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything you've done. The grace was given in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Watch what A.W. Tozer says here. He says, the one who does not expect God won't. The one who does not expect God won't. And will discount God's every single time when he does speak. Will discount him and call it their own words. Imagine that. How many times people want to speak for God? They'll discount what God has to say as if their own words mean something. And we live in a culture and we live in it today in a society where your words mean more than God's words. And what you're for mean more than who God is. God is saying, I want you to see yourself the way I see you. Here it is, because you don't always behave in a way that's consistent with the way that God sees you and you see yourself. How do you see yourself? What identity do you have in Christ Jesus? Or is your identity in culture? Has culture claimed you and God you've forgotten about? Because as time continues to move, things are going to get worse in culture. I'm not saying culture is bad. I'm saying culture don't always recognize God. And they don't recognize God because they're not of God. And when you're not of God, you won't recognize who God is. Because you do things on your own intuition and not through the Holy Spirit. We have to understand. We say we follow Christ. It's good to do it on a Sunday morning. But can you do it out there on Monday afternoon? Is Jesus still number one in your life Monday through Saturday? Or is he, do you just check a box on Sunday at 10 a.m. And say, that's my God time. But everything else belonged to me. No. You carry the gospel with you. And this is the deal. The United States, please hear me, online and in the building, the United States is going to get harder and harder and harder and harder to be a place where we say Jesus and where we recognize who God is. It's going to happen. So saints, that's what we call us, saints, we got to get ready. And we get ready through the word of God not through trying to change everybody. Let God do the changing and we do the actual behavior aspect of who he is in our life, which means our behavior is different, our words different, our thoughts are different, and how we love people is different. Because what culture want is love me and accept me and affirm me regardless of who you are. Yes, I can love you, but I'm not going to affirm your behavior because it's not of God. And when it's not of God, you got to be able to stand flat-footed and say, Hey, I represent, hey, I'm over here. If it's 30,000 people, I'm the one that's for Christ. If everybody else have their head down, I'm the one for Jesus. I'm the one for God. Well, we don't want you here. I'm still for Jesus. You ain't got to want me here. We got to be the one that stand boldly. And say, I'm all about God, even if you never are for him. Because what you are for doesn't change what I'm for. God. Because people believe that your love should affirm their behavior. And this is the deal. Please hear me, parents. If your love supposed to affirm every behavior, let your children do anything they want. Let them do anything. Let them do any. Let let. Let them do anything they want. Let them make all of the decisions in their life from birth to adulthood. You wouldn't be a parent. You'll be an affirming person that birthed out a kid. You would not be a parent. Because 
He says, train them in a way that they shall go. You see how that, 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 that's countercultural? Change them in a way that they shall go. And when they depart, they will, they, will, they will not leave here saying or wondering. He says, train them up in a way that they shall go. And when they get older, they will not depart from it. So God is not going to give word and turn around and lie to himself. Because you parent a child. You parent a child. You parent them. Because you know it's not good for them. You know it's not good. So you can't affirm everything that's not good. You can't affirm everything. You affirm them with the word. You watch them in the word. You affirm them with the word of God. And that's going to be counterculture and they're going to have to deal with it. Watch this. Here it is. In the process of people growth and transformation. Here it is. You can hurt some people when you're growing. And this is the deal. You can't be over-interested in everybody's feelings because we live in a culture today where everybody's feelings want to, to affirm their actions. You can't. And people will tell you that you don't love them. You don't love me because I don't agree with you. Man, I don't agree with my kids all the time. I still love them. You can love people and disagree with them. I'm not going to agree with you driving the car off a cliff. And then you get mad at me and say, I don't love you. Transformation, identity in Christ, means that you can't agree with everything. You got to go to God's word and say, well, this is what his word says. Well, you judge me. This is what his word say. Well, you judge me. This is what his word say. No, 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 no. This is righteous judgment right here. I love one of our elders. He's always said when I talk to him, he said, well, let, let's take it to the word. Let's take it to the word. The Bible says during the wrestling, something happens to his hip, Jacob. And he walks with a limp, and the limp is reminding us of the process he had to go through. And, and he goes from a version of worst to best in himself. And the things Jacob is limping for is external. But we have some internal limpings going on in us. We're limping it's internally. You know how you limp internally? Let me tell you. When you sit there and you know it's wrong, but you love them so much that you'll let them fail. And you won't use God's word to correct. Here's God's word. And sometimes we don't have to say anything. But let me give you, let me give you God's word. Let me give you God's word. And, God, and, and if you can look at God's word and go the other way, you went on your own volition. You, that's what you wanted. Will I still love you? I'm going to love you, but I'm going to give you truth. Because truth, truth is love. So I can't say I love you and won't give you truth that's better for you. Because God is trying to get you to see. Now the limping is regret. The limping is career regret, relationship regret. And, and we wish we didn't do that. We wish we didn't do this. We, we, we need more of who we are to be present in the lives of people because God is saying, I have a word from, from myself through you to them. And that's what God is trying to get us to see. He wrestled. He wrestled. In closing, he wrestled. He wrestled. And he continued to wrestle because there was a transformation shift that was happening in Jacob that Jacob couldn't see. And he couldn't see it because he was too busy fighting, being self-reliant and independent. I remember when I got married, both my wife and I, we were single, of course, and I was living by myself, she was living by herself. And when we came together, there were some things that we were doing that we were still acting like we were super independent. I had to get accustomed to some things because I'd been by myself for years and, and was still doing things like it was nobody in my house but me. And I know we can do things for a long time by ourselves and we don't even consider God. Jacob won this battle, but this is how Jacob won the battle. He was limping and he was wrestling, and he was wrestling with a man. He was wrestling with God. And Jacob won in the sense that he endured all the way through the struggle. But God conquered. Now please understand, you can have a, you 
can have a Job experience. You can, you can even have a Jonah experience. But God is going to get you right where he needs you to be. And you're going to hear him clearly, and you're going to have a choice. Do you want to live with your identity in Christ or identity and culture and who you are? And it's all about you. Self-absorbed, narcissistic, wanting nothing more than to be you and to be the star. Because this is the deal. God is saying we need real men that will tell the real truth about who I am. But most people are looking for celebrities. And that's one thing that although social media can be good, it can be bad. Because in anything you get, you can get what you want and whatever you get, you're going to get some things you don't want. And the deal is, is that we have to make a decision of what we really want. Do we really want Christ? Jacob won because he gave himself to God. He had no other choice. Jonah, he won because he got tired of running. He won. He received the gift that God had for him, but he had to come to the conclusion that he could not run no more. He could not run anymore. He could not run anymore. And the problem is, is that we continue to run. We continue to run. And here it is. When you battle with God, you only win by losing. And by not giving up until you know that you've lost. That's how Jacob won. Can you lose for God, but win with God? Can you lose and say, I'm going to give myself, I'm going to lose all the things I thought that were good for me, that I had in this mind of mine, this imagination, these thoughts, my self-reliance, my independence. Can I lose all of that so I can win with God? Will you give up you so you can be who he created you to be? Are you ready to give up? I know culture say, you don't ever give up. No, 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 we always win. We don't ever give up. You can give yourself up to God and you'll win every time. Are you ready to give yourself to Christ? He wrestled. But this is what he did. He embraced his new identity because it empowered him to live a life that honored God and to serve God's kingdom. So, so can you seek God's blessing? But what you got to do first is you got to surrender and watch him transform your identity. How many of us want the best life we could ever have? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. We want the best life we can ever have. This is the deal. We can be fooled that we can achieve it by ourselves. But I can, I can 100% guarantee you this, 100%, that it would be better with God than without Him. You don't see everything that's coming. He does. Are you willing to give yourself to Him? Even if you've saved already and say, you know what, my life hadn't been in line with who He is and what His words say. Can you be in line with His word? And if you don't know Jesus, it's the perfect time. God wants an opportunity to show you who he is every day and to love you in a way that nobody else can love you. And surround you with people that will love you for who he is in you and because of you are his creation. How many of us want to be loved because of who we are and how God created us? That's how we want to be loved. That's real love. Can you love me for me? No, no, you're not going to be perfect. None of us are. But we'll never have to make the excuse about perfection because we know God will speak to us and talk to us about who he is and who we are and what we should believe. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father God, I thank you for our time. I thank you for this moment. Thank you for the persistent nature, the surrender and the transformation of of our identity in you. Father, you mean so much to us. 
Father, let us embrace the process of being renewed as your followers. Teach us and show us and lead us and guide us, and we thank you for your protection. And Father God, we need you right now. Online and in the building, we need you. We want more of you. Father, touch our hearts, renew our minds, and strengthen us in every way that you can. But if you don't know Jesus, it's the time to surrender yourself to Almighty God that loves you and care about you and want the best for you. It's simple. You can repeat after me. Father God, I'm a sinner. I open my heart and give myself to you because of your righteousness and who you are. And you created me to worship you. That's the purpose. That's my first purpose in life, God. It's to worship you. I need you. I love you. I honor you. Because I'm walking alone. Father, I desire not to rely totally on myself for anything. You said in your word, and all that get it, get understanding, and we want to be understood better, but understanding comes from you. Father, take over my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit. Let your loving presence and the power of the Holy Spirit reside on the inside of me every day. I honor you, Father. Father, I have many, many questions, but I know you are the answer. There's many, many decisions that I have to make, but I need you. There's many, many things that are going on in my life, but I need you. So, Father, change the outcome of my life from this day forward. I'm a sinner. I give myself to you. Change me. Lead me. Father, I just don't want to receive from you, but I want you to tell me what to do in my life so my life can be better. I want to be guided by you. I want to be loved by you. Your love is different from culture's love. I want to be corrected by you. I want to be uplifted by you. I want to be loved by you in no other way that no human can love me. Take control of me, Father. Forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart that Jesus is risen from the dead and therefore I'm saved. And I thank you, Father, for rescuing me in a moment of time of my uncertainty and my insecurity. I need you, Father. Touch my heart and captivate my mind and lead me into the presence of the Holy Spirit every day. I want to read your word and grow in you and love you. So, Father, I don't want to do it just on a Sunday morning. I want to be vocal everywhere I go about a Savior I know that transform me and transform the world. Teach me, Father, and renew my strength and give me your love as only you can. I'll be sure to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In the majestic name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. God is totally awesome. God is totally magnificent, and we thank God today for our time. Hey, just want to shout out a few words to you online. If you have made the... Uh, the sacrifice if you surrendered and given yourself to Jesus Christ can you let the moderator there know that you've given yourself to Jesus Christ we want to connect with you you can go to revivechurchatl.org send us your name we'd like to pray for you we'd like to to walk with you in that journey of faith in an, as a new believer should be walked with by other believers we want to get you and show you what your next steps are so you can fully, fully, fully commit to walking through the Bible and understanding and growing in Jesus Christ. So thank you. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for those that have been saved online and those in the building. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Hey, just a few few things I want to, uh, for you to know. My daughter always said, Dad, don't you forget to say, follow us on Instagram, <laughs> Snapchat, if we're there. Um, TikTok, YouTube. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph, Joseph said, you funny, Pastor, you funny. But no, seriously, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Uh, so much of our information is there. We want to connect with you and walk with you as a new believer. And connect, comment, like, and share uh, our social media pages and our website and this message today. Um, thank God for you. Second of all, I want to mention that 
we have a few announcements. One announcement is we have Men Talk Tuesdays on Tuesdays. Men Talk Tuesdays on Tuesdays. It's a 7 p.m. offering, and it's online at revivechurchatl.org. Also, we have um, an offering of discipleship study. Discipleship study is a Bible study that we have online at revivechurchatl.org. If you do not understand God's Word, we want to walk with you through God's Word. We go through a verse-by-verse study where we look at the Greek and the Hebrew and we break things down and we understand God's Word because we want to know God's Word. Not, not just, you know, because we we, we've been religified. I think that's the word. Religified. We've been religified to the point that everything can mean something in an instant. We'll take Scripture and give it 55 different meanings. When hermeneutically, there's only one interpretation of the meaning of Scripture. One. But we'll take nine different verses out of context and use it to tell our kids what they should do. So we want to be in context so we can grow in Christ. Right? We really want to understand the meaning. Because you know culture's way, culture's way today says there's nine different meanings for one word. It may mean something in different places, but in the English translation, it has one meaning. So we have that offering on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. It's an online offering. You don't have to come to a building or anything like that. And coming up here very soon, we're going to be giving out 300 boxes of food, and it will happen in August, but we're kind of wrestling with the dates there a little bit. It might be moved back to September, so look forward to We will want you to come out and serve. It will be here at South Cobb High School where we will make those offerings and give food out on a Saturday. The dates are coming. The dates are coming. Also, if you have a student here today and your children do not have backpacks, there are backpacks in our lobbies that we want to give to your children. So please, if you have a son or a daughter that's here present with you today, make sure, let them, walk them to the table, let them pick out whatever they want. They're kids, let them enjoy themselves. You know, because we wanted our Spider-Man book bag, you know, and we'd cry if we didn't get it, right? So let them have a little fun, enjoy themselves, and pick out the book bag they want. You know, if they want one for toys and for their books, go ahead. It's cool. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. They're kids. They want to enjoy themselves. So those are made for you and outside for you or your kids if you so desire for your kids to have one. It's okay. It's okay. It's, it's, it's our love for our kids today, and we love our kids always. Okay? So um, it's giving back time. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for an opportunity to give to God, opportunity to give to God. Thank you for your generosity. Your generosity has helped us in our community. We are an out-of-the-box type of church where we do so much outside of Sunday service. Reason being is that what Jesus did and what we are commanded to do, to go out to people and love on them right where they are and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you know People don't want to know how much you know until they know how much you really care about them. And when you can show that you care, they're willing to listen to who Christ is. So God has put things in our hands for us to go out and give to people and say, listen, the love of Jesus Christ compelled me to come to you and share the good news of Jesus Christ to you. And we do that in here as we gather together, but we also do it out there Monday through Saturday so we can give and love on the people in our community. It's amazing that some churches have community in their church, but they only show community when you come to them. You ever seen that? That people people are like, well, we're, we're community. We're all about the community. Now show up to our house. And you never see them. We believe in being involved. A great gathering like this is fantastic for encouragement and loving on Christ and for the purpose of glorifying Him in worship. But that's not where we stop. Monday morning when we wake up, Sunday evening, Sunday night, Monday morning, all the way through when we come back here, it's an opportunity for us to deliver the good news of Jesus Christ to people. And that's what we are. We're disciples of Jesus Christ that walk out our faith, not just talk about it. Okay? So, 
There's three ways to give here. Three ways to give. One way to give, you can text any amount to 84321. Online and in the building, text any amount to 84321. You'll receive a link. Once you receive the link, scroll down, click it on, scroll down, and you'll see the green logo with the white R. It says Revive Church. Click that. You can give any amount that God has placed on your heart. Any amount that God has placed on your heart. Here at Revive Church, we believe giving is between you and God. Even so, we got a scripture for it. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. Watch what it says. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under any compulsion. God loves the cheerful giver. So, we don't do things like most churches do. We give you God's word. You talk to God. What God places in your hand, you decide in your heart what to give. Simple as that. Simple as that. There's no reason to, to, to do 50 other different things other than God's word, your heart, connected to his for what you have and what you decide to give. That's it. Another way to give, to my right and to your left, is a giving box here. You can place it there if you so desire. Another way in which you can give, you go to revivechurchatl.org, click the giving tab, and follow the instructions there. Let us pray over our giving. Let's bow our heads for a quick moment of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this, your people, your people, Father. Thank you for their heart to give and for those that were unable to give. Thank you for their desire. Father, thank you for placing what's in their hand that you've touched their heart to give. Let it be blessed. Let it move forth. Let it us continue to use it to go out and embrace our community and lead others to you. We thank you, Father, for their heart, mind, soul, and spirit and their desire to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in their giving. Thank you for what's in their hands and thank you that it will be used to glorify you. We thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. We thank God for all things. Hey, family, we want to go on mission and revive the world and we thank God for you. We thank God for you. All of those that are new, if you look over your left shoulder, if you looked over your left shoulder, there's a lady there standing with a sign that says first time guest. If this is your first time here, I would love to connect with you, meet you, find out how you heard about us, and we thank God for you. If you'll be able to follow her, the first time guest table is out there to the left, and I look forward to connecting with you. Online and in the building, thank God for the opportunity to share God's word for you. It means a lot to us here at Revive Church. You could have chose to go anywhere, but you chose to come here, and we thank God for you. And we're going to honor God in prayer right now as we exit and leave here today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for this time. As we leave here today, keep us, lead us, and guide us. Keep us safe, and that we'll do all that you've asked of us. And Father, we want to hear you louder and clearer even more. Father, bring about clarity in our lives that when we pray and persistently pray to you, that we'll hear you, understand you, and Father, we'll follow your guide, your lead in our life. Father, bless those that are concerned about things. Answer what's in their heart. Touch their mind, soul, and spirit each day. Father, we thank you for the coming of a new day and a new week that we get an opportunity to serve you and demonstrate who you are in our life to so many that is looking for a righteous Savior. We thank you for all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let's go on mission to revive the world. God bless you. Thank you for everything. If you're in need of prayer, our elders will come down front. We have elders that will come down front that would love to pray for you. Two of our elders will be down. If you are in need of prayer, we have two elders down front that would love to pray for you. We thank God for you. God bless you. Let's go on mission to revive the world together. Make it a great week. God bless you. Take care now.